Welcome, this is our first 555 tutorial in our mini series. We're gonna do four tutorials total. And in this tutorial, we are just going to describe what a 555 timer is, what's going on inside, and just give you a better understanding of how it works. And then we'll also get into in the next three tutorials about how you can use it in the most common configurations. I just wanna do a shout out to Jayesh, who is, this is his first tutorial that he has done for us. He's done some FAQs and he's done an amazing job. So if you wanna see the written tutorial, which always has more depth and information, definitely go check that out. As it is, let's jump into this. So a 555 timer, which you've probably heard of if you've been in the electronics industry at all, is simply a timer that can create a pulse of varying pulse widths, or it can be a one shot where you push a button and it'll make your output go high for a certain controllable amount of time, or you can make it so you push a button and it stays one state, push another button, it stays another state. And you can use this in all sorts of different applications. It's basically just really helpful if you're doing anything timing it. If it's for LEDs, any sort of signal or clock generation, uh, stuff like that. And you don't wanna do a microcontroller where you're programming it and this and that and all that sort of stuff. A 555 timer is a very simple, robust way to get that good pulse modulated signal or control the timing in some other way. But it's kind of interesting on the inside and we're gonna go over it. I was gonna draw it out, but I realized that this circuit's crazy enough that my drawing skills are just gonna be terrible. So I'm going to use the internal schematic that we have on our website. I'm just gonna use it and I'm gonna point around and we're gonna walk through it so you can see exactly how it works and what's going on. And it's a little bit overwhelming at first. And I think the majority of the problem that I have at least is that there's a lot of things where it goes in high here and then it's low here and it's inverted here and it goes out here. And so it's like, wait, this is high, which makes that low, which makes that high, which makes that low. Okay, so that makes, oh goodness. So it's a little bit easy to get confused on that stuff. Don't worry about it. It's just gonna take a little bit of time and in the next tutorials, we'll try and make sure that we go through it very clearly so that it's easy to follow how each thing affects each other. So with that, let's jump to the screen recording where I'm going to just go through and you're gonna see exactly how this all fits together. Okay, so on this circuit diagram, we decided to basically organize this logically instead of in the normal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight organization. We started with six and two over here on the left and then moved to the right basically the way the, the logic flows and the circuit flows. And so it makes it a little bit weird from a pin standpoint, but also just really helps understand exactly what is going on here. So with that, let's actually go and briefly go over those inputs and outputs, and then we'll come back and go into them in a little bit more detail. So here we have the threshold and the trigger, and those are your two main inputs, basically. Those are the two inputs that you'd use to control it. Now there's other things, but those are the main ones that you would worry about. And then you have, of course, your power, VCC and ground, and then control. And this is just a way to override something, which we'll get into later, don't worry about it too much. You have your reset, which can, is also another thing to override your uh, SR flip-flop here, your discharge, and then your output here. So of these, again, you mostly use these inputs. Of course, you use power and ground, discharge and output, which we will go over this because that's pretty interesting and a critical part of the monostable configuration. But with that, let's work through this and we'll just go through each one of these chunks and talk about exactly how they all fit together. So this first little portion right here is what gives the 555 timer its name. It's a three five kilo ohm resistors that creates a voltage divider. So five, 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 five thousand, five thousand, five thousand. Anyway, this voltage divider circuit is providing reference voltages for these comparators right here. So as you look at it, uh, typically VCC on a 555 timer can be anywhere from five volts or like 4.5 up to somewhere around 15 volts. I don't remember exactly, but it's a pretty decent amount. If you look here, assume that you have 10 volts input, you will have 6.6 .6 volts here, or two thirds of VCC, and 3.3 volts here, or one third of VCC right here. And so frequently you'll hear when talking about 555 timers about the two thirds VCC and the one thirds VCC. And this is where 
it's getting that from because of course VCC is going to change. Even though I said 6.6 .6 and 3.3, .3, if you had seven volts as an input, then that's not gonna work, or seven volts as power, then obviously those voltages are going to be off. So to be more accurate, we say two thirds and one third. So with that, we get this two thirds VCC going into the inverting input of this top comparator. And on the non-inverting input, we have our threshold input. So depending on the voltage on our threshold versus two thirds VCC, we'll control what our output is here. On this bottom comparator, we have as our reference, one third VCC going into our non-inverting input and our trigger going into our inverting input. So if you don't remember exactly how comparators work, we just did some tutorials on op amps and we went over comparator circuits. So you can go check that out if you want more detail. Just as a quick reminder, what happens is if you have a higher voltage on your non-inverting input than on your inverting input, your output will be high. If you have a lower voltage on your non-inverting, or another way to say it, if you have a higher voltage on your inverting input, then your voltage will be low. So that's the concept there. So these comparators right here go over here and drive this SR flip-flop. So the SR flip-flop can be really confusing because on the internet, sometimes people will create truth tables and instead of just having S and R, which stands for set and reset, it'll have S bar and R bar, basically the inverse. And so the output will be different and it gets really confusing sometimes. I don't know why there's no standard way of doing that, but for the way we're doing it, just so you know, when we're talking about it, we are assuming that it's just S and R, Q and Q bar or Q inverted. And so with this, uh, again, this is really high level, but with a flip-flop, SR flip-flop, if your reset is zero and your set is one, then your output Q will be one and Q bar will be zero. Now, the other way around, if your reset is one and your set is zero, then your Q will be zero and your Q bar will be one. And if both your set and reset are zero, then whatever the previous state was, it stays the same. And so that's why SR or flip-flops in general are considered sequential um, digital logic instead of just combination digital logic in that it matters what the previous state was. So if S and R are both zero, then whatever the output was, it stays the same. And you should never have both inputs being one because you basically don't know what your output can be and it'll be kind of crazy. So you want to avoid having both of those be one, which we do when we're dealing with 555 timers, but just if you ever deal with a flip-flop yourself later. So again, if S is one and R is zero, Q is one. If R is one and S is zero, Q is zero, and of course, Q bar is the opposite. So this is important because it goes out to this output and you think, why is the output Q bar? This output not only is a provides the power, it also inverts it. So even though we are pulling internally from Q bar, the actual output here at pin three is the same as Q. And that's really important to remember. And like I said, it's part of the confusion of, okay, you, you got your value here that's compared to here, that's going into here, that's going into here, that goes actually inverse here, and then goes here. Oh my goodness, what's going on? And again, it can be complicated, but you break it down, work it, take copious notes as you're trying to figure it out. At least that's what worked for me to make it click. So with that one final thing that I want to talk about is this discharge. So the strange thing is this is kind of an input and kind of an output. This pin is designed specifically to discharge an external capacitor. That is literally its purpose in life is to be connected to a capacitor. And when Q bar goes high, it turns on and closes this switch, basically this BJT, and it takes wherever your capacitor is and just discharges it to ground. And that's its whole purpose in life. And we will go over that in the other modes of why that's important, but it is important because that way you can get some cool timing effects and stuff like that. So this literally just is here to make it so you can discharge a capacitor. Again, reset is to control your SR flip-flop and control is here to override this top comparator. So if you want to do something specific with your threshold and control and don't want to be dependent on this two thirds VCC here, you can manually change that voltage. And that's about it for the internal aspect of a 555 timer. 
So that's the internal workings of the 555 timer. And I just went over the basic, here are the parts and here's the relation. I didn't really show any of the ways that they work together because the best way to do that is with an example. Our next tutorial is going to be on a monostable configuration and I'll talk about that in a moment. And in that tutorial, we'll go over and we'll go very in depth on how these are all related and how you change this to get that and we'll try and keep everything as clear as possible. So we will do that later. But for this, I just wanted to show you what's going on inside. So it's not just a black box. And frankly, if you don't care, all of this information is out there. You could look up, oh, I want a monostable circuit. And you, you just grab it, grab the diagram off the internet. And they say, hey, to get this timing, you just need to multiply this resistance and this capacitance. And that'll give you the timing. And you don't need to know what's going on in here. But it helps so much to actually understand how it works. And it, frankly, it's really quite cool. So with that, I want to mention the three next tutorials that we have in their configurations, because I think this is a good thing to be repetitive on. And that's basically there are three very common configurations for a 555 timer. And if you hear the names of them, it should make a lot of sense. But it's good to just hear it over and over again. And that is the mono stable configuration the bi-stable configuration and the a-stable configuration. And basically the monostable configuration is where there's only one stable state for the 555 timer, that the output wants to settle to a certain state. And typically that's low. And so when that happens, you push a button, push a switch, it'll change states. And then after a certain amount of time, it'll go back to its stable state. So it has one or mono one stable state. Now, a bi-stable configuration is actually where you have usually two buttons and you press one button, it'll switch to one state forever. You press the other button, it'll switch to the other state forever. And that then has two stable states that you can just push the button, it makes that switch. It won't flip flop back on you unintentionally or intentionally. You just push the button and that's the stable configuration. Push the other button, that's the other stable configuration. And then the third one is the A-stable configuration. And as you might guess, that means there is no stable configuration. And that is basically where you're using a 555 timer as a PWM or a, uh, basically a square wave generator. And it'll just oscillate back and forth and you can control the speed of the oscillation and the width of the pulses and all that sort of stuff. But that is the A-stable um, configuration because you don't have any buttons or switches. It's just constantly oscillating between one and zero on the output. And again, I'll go over those one, I'll, I'll go over each one of those in depth in the next three tutorials. And two, I will probably go over all three of the names again, just so it clicks and it sinks in a little bit harder because for some reason, it took a while for me to remember which one was which. And I'm hoping that you don't have the same problem I did. Okay, that's all we have for this, for this overview of the 555 timers. I hope you found that helpful. I hope you found the concept and the inner workings of the 555 timer fascinating. I hope you'll join us with the next tutorial with the mono stable configuration. If you did enjoy this video, give it a like, subscribe to our channel, all that good stuff. As it is, we will catch you in the next one. Have a great day.